ahead and dive into one of the most interesting parts of the day, which is talking uh, with Marla. So Marla is the co-founder and CEO of Blue Mercury. Uh, who's been to a Blue Mercury in the room? All right, excellent, excellent. Uh, I have not shopped there, uh, but I hear great things. Um, the, it's a luxury beauty retailer and cosmetics brand um, that was founded in 1999 uh, and started here in Georgetown. Um, and uh, it was in 2015 acquired by Macy's, but uh, Marla's experience goes well beyond that. Um, she's also uh, co the co-founder of M61 Laboratories and N61 Skincare, uh, which is a vegan cosmetics line. Um, and uh, she also is, uh, I've, I've go at, gotta go ahead and plug it because she's a fellow Kennedy School alum, but um, before, uh, becoming an entrepreneur, had a life as a McKinsey consultant, uh, holds an MBA from Harvard Business School, an MPA from uh, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and a BA in economics uh, from Berkeley. So we're really lucky to be joined by her today to learn a little bit about what this journey is going to be like. Uh, so Marla, please welcome to the stage. All right. So. Um, let's go ahead and start off with a softball. Uh, <laughs> when, so when did you first begin to think of yourself as an entrepreneur? Wait, first I have to say thank you to you guys for all the great work you do. Thank you, Dr. Kuno, and thank you, Kate. What an impressive group of entrepreneurs, right? I mean, let's, it's a, it's a hard journey, and they're starting off um, right now, so I'm so excited for you. Well, I, I didn't really think of myself as an entrepreneur until I was in my mid-20s. Um, it was sort of a all th three different things coming together. My father was an entrepreneur, um, and I used to work in his accounting department when I was in high school. I grew up in a middle-class family in Oakland. Uh, my father never went to college, um, and so when I was working in his accounting department, I was reconciling books by hand. Um, with um, anyone remember the mimeograph paper? No, <laughs> that, sh that shows how, how old I am. Um, but so I was close to business my whole life, um, but never thought I would be an entrepreneur. And then I went to grad school in Boston, and there was an obscure entrepreneur that came and talked to us about e-commerce and the internet. So when I was in business school, we had just gotten our first email addresses, and Google did not exist at all. And so this entrepreneur came, and he spoke to a room of about 30 of us, and was telling us about how he was going to revolutionize the purchase of books. This was Jeff Bezos, and Amazon was only three years old, it wasn't public, and I was mesmerized. Uh, this concept of being able to buy things electronically. Uh, but I didn't do anything about it. Um, I went to private equity after grad school. I came here, actually, and then I met someone who changed my life. It's my husband, Barry. Um, I was in private equity. I tried to buy his company. <laughs> and he wouldn't sell it to me, but every day he was in my ear. Why are you working for someone else? Why don't you start your own thing? And so it was these three events, my father, Jeff Bezos, and my husband, that brought me to entrepreneurship, but only my mid-twenties. So. Um, so if anyone needs dating advice, try to buy their company, and uh, apparently that works out. Um, so, uh, so we've had, we've actually had, again, the, the pleasure of having a lot of incredible entrepreneurs on this stage before. Um, and the one thing, you know, this term entrepreneur that, it, it's weird, I, I gotta say it's weird how often um, there are very kind of like vivid and generally like very painful analogies mm -hmm. that people make to what being an entrepreneur is like. So what I'm interested in is kind of what do you, how, how would you be able to contextualize what the entrepreneurial experience is like? So I'll tell you what Elon Musk said and then I'll give you a better vision. So <laughs> Elon Musk said entrepreneurship is like eating glass and staring into the abyss. So I'll give you a more fun analogy. Um, so every summer we go to Ocean City, New Jersey with our family, and there's a ride called Double Shot. Anyone ever been on Double Shot? So it's this huge tower, and you're strapped to a chair, and it gently takes you up. The, it's almost like a radio tower size, and then it drops you halfway, and then it takes you up a little bit, and then it drops you to the bottom, and then it takes you all the way back up really fast and drops you straight down. That's entrepreneurship, which is... The highs are really high, the lows are really low, and there are so many things in between. And I'll give you some examples at Blue Mercury. We started in 1999. 
the first year, you know, really high. We got a meeting with Leonard Lauder. Really low, we almost ran out of money, right? Really high, we raised a couple years later $50 million. Really low, our e-commerce site shut down for a week and someone stole a truckload of products. So you have these amazing highs, amazing lows, uh, and then it studies out for a little bit. But that first year is really hard and you have those highs and lows. And you know what, every summer I tell my kids I'm never going on that again, and then I go the next summer. <laughs> So staying on the double shot analogy, um, so if you're on double shot, uh, you know, there's a mechanical process that kind of like when you get all the way down, it brings you back up. Um, and that just doesn't exist if you're a human being and not a machine. So how do you, when you hit those low points, like how do you personally get through them? Yeah. Um, so there is nothing like a good walk. Um, and Barry and I, since we started Blue Mercury, we have walked uh, anywhere from one to four miles every day. And so there's something about getting outside uh, and talking through your problems. So I say find a partner and go for a walk and try to clear your head. Uh, because it's only one part, right? Double Shot has highs and lows. And we've been entrepreneurs for, gosh, it'll be 18 years this September, and we still have great highs and great lows. But you've got to reframe the problem and find a partner that can help you reframe the problem. And at one point, Barry and I calculated how far we've walked. We've walked halfway around the world together. So we've got one more half to go. So. This is so romantic. I love this. <laughs> Did not expect this. Um, <laughs> so um, so uh, it's Valentine's Day, right? It's in, it's in the air. Um, when you're looking at up-and-coming entrepreneurs, um, you know, like some of the ones we saw today, what's kind of the one trait that you're looking for that you've been able to kind of see in your own journey that you know is gonna, is gonna be necessary to, to move their venture forward against a lot of obstacles? Well, I think we saw it today, right? All of these entrepreneurs on stage have passion. You have to have passion or you cannot get through those highs and lows. The first year is always the hardest. Uh, you have these incredible highs. You have these nights that you, you know, that you can't even sleep, and the next morning you don't want to get out of bed. And so, if you don't have that passion to work 24/7, it won't work. And the first year, you're hiring people. You're trying to, you know, tell everyone your vision, and at home, you're freaking out. And so, you have to be able to get through that time. Passion drives that. You also, I think, have to have hustle. Hustle, you know, to, to make the call, to get on the plane for the meeting, to just do whatever it takes. And then I also have been thinking about, you also have to be willing to face the truth, you know, which conflicts with passion sometimes. So passion, you're, you're all in. Um, but sometimes you get these truths, like a customer doesn't like your product, uh, or a funder thinks you're doing the wrong thing. And you have to, you, you can pitch, but you have to go back and say, okay, what did I learn from this? And the only way that works is if you're truthful with yourself about what you're hearing. So I think that, that ability to be truthful is, is really important. Um, so I'll just go ahead and throw out that I'm not gonna monopolize all the questions. Uh, we're, gonna have peop we're gonna be doing a Q&A with the audience. If you were on Facebook, on the interwebs, uh, you can actually, on Facebook, uh, we were live streaming this on Facebook, uh, ask questions. So we're gonna get to the Q&A shortly. Um, so, you know, refine the wording of that question. Uh, anyway, um, you don't really have to. You, we'll give you the mic, you can say whatever you'd like. Um, but kind of another, you know, we were talking and we've been talking a lot, both at a high level uh, about social entrepreneurship obviously very on the ground look at some of the entrepreneurs and what they're doing um but again a lot of skeptics out there a lot of people yeah. say you really you know you've got one bottom line you got to make money um how does social impact factor into business is social enterprise kind of something that's real and viable or should you just create a successful business make a lot of money and then create a philanthropy and give it away so I've been thinking about this a lot, and um, I'm active with the Kennedy School of Government and social entrepreneurship, and I had this debate with Dean Elmendorf about how do you measure social entrepreneurship, and he said, well, we're trying to figure it out, and then he gave me a reading list of about 20 books. Um, and what I realized is that there are hundreds of different metrics, and so I took a step back and thought about, okay, as a leader, when you're running a, a new organization, what's your job, right? And your job is to set the mission and to set the metrics and then get everyone going on the same path. And so at a company, your mission is straightforward, right? It, well, your mission can be anything. Our mission at Blue Mercury is to be the best at giving beauty advice, 
right? And so that's a mission that's tangible and long-term, but never-ending. Most of the missions we saw today are also tangible and long-term and never-ending. But then you come up with the metrics. So at a company, it's revenue, cost, profit. You're looking at all of those. In your own organization, you're also looking at those. But you also have to have other metrics. So as we were listening to people, I was thinking, okay, what, what are some metrics that this group could think about? Okay, number of miles of road laid down, right? I mean, there are a lot of metrics. You have to choose what's right for your business and deal in truth and not pay attention to all of these journals, which I've been reading. There's like social return on investment. There's cost benefit analysis. There's hundreds of metrics. But when you are running your day-to-day -day organization, there's a reality of what you need to measure to keep moving forward. And I think if you can't do it on a piece of paper with a pencil, uh, you won't be able to make progress. So I think it's up to you as a leader to determine your metrics that you're going to measure to, and they can change over time. At Blue Mercury, we measure you know, number of visits per cl by clients. We measure whether we get um, our clients give us their email addresses and phone numbers because it's an indicator of great service. So every business has more than one set of measurements, and I think you know, with social entrepreneurship, you have to set your own metrics and not listen to the noise. But I, I think... I think there's going to be a lot more analysis around this. And the, the question comes back to what's the value you're, you're creating? So what's the value you're creating for your whole constituents? How many lives are you saving? I, I think this, as long as we can do a lot of good and have some metric for that, to me, that's actually enough. We shouldn't beat our brains in about the perfect metric. So um, one last question, and then I want to really open it up to the audience. Um, in our experience here, we see it a lot. Um, you know, there are a lot of structural barriers to um, you know getting a diverse and inclusive entrepreneurial community going. Um, as 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 a woman who uh, who's an entrepreneur, uh, what do you think needs to happen to make sure that opportunities uh, to be a successful entrepreneur are open to everyone? Yeah, this is. Um a passion of mine because only 3% of venture capital goes to women right now. So out of the $57 billion per year going to venture capital, $2 billion go to women. So let's think about that. So 16% of angel capital goes to women. Um, and I don't know all of the other statistics for the, the other groups that are really important. Um, and so I, I've been thinking, unless we set a goal or a target and then reverse into that, we won't make any progress. So it took Harvard Business School 50 years to go from zero females to 50%. So I keep thinking, in 10 years, can we go to 30% of venture capital being funded by women? We've been studying this issue, and what we found, which is interesting, um, I've been studying it with uh, two professors at Harvard Business School. Um, we have a new study. It's called um, The Secrets of Highly Successful Women Entrepreneurs, where we have um, looked at female entrepreneurs that have raised um, at least $25 million, um, and we've surveyed them and understood sort of some of their key success factors. And one of them, which we should all think about, is 83% of them had a male champion in their fundraising. So what does that mean for making progress? We need to face the truth, which is we're all in it together to get more funding to groups that don't get the funding. And that if you are someone in venture capital, you need to try to lift up other people. And so the stats are pretty impressive. Also, 64% had angel capital. So the angel capital funnel is absolutely critical. Um, so more to come on these studies, but I think unless we start measuring the size of the problem, which we just started to do with women, and then measuring sort of the, the way to be successful, we can't have impact. So really important issue um, for many of us, uh, and more to come on this. All right, so we'll go ahead and take questions from the audience. The first hand is up right there. Uh, so we'll, we, have, we have mics coming around, um, just so we can make sure that, uh, it, actually the person with the mic is also named Mike. Um, <laughs> Mala, is this on? Thank you very much, Mala. I'm very curious about your, the, <clears throat> your use of your metrics and how does any of your metrics, you, you're using metrics from customers, et cetera, how much of your data is also feedback from your employees, much like would you ever go out like undercover boss and make sure you are listening not only to those who are working for you and also incentivizing them 
by uh, giving them, returning some of the, your shares instead of your taking all the profits, uh, but returning to them and making them entrepreneurs perhaps. You know, you have that capability of, of mentoring yourself as opposed to going beyond your, your big corporation. And uh, very quickly, what's your name? as well? My name is Joanna Brignolo. Excellent. Thank you. Hi, hi Joanna. Thank you. So um, the greatest thing about Blue Mercury is that we started it and I have really close relationships with all of our staff in the field. So that feedback is taken daily and our staff are really comfortable sending me uh, texts and here's what's going on, here's what we need to fix. In fact, every Friday I do a, a 3 p.m. phone call with our new managers uh, and have an open forum on questions. And so those relationships and the culture of your company is really important. The other thing that I'm proud of and why I think we're such an open uh, company is because our whole mission was always to promote people from within. And so we started um, in the beauty industry when uh, people, most beauty experts or makeup artists only got um, uh, 10 to 20 hours a week of work so that the big companies didn't have to pay benefits. And we said, you know what, we're going to start with only full-time work and we want our teams to have benefits. And so what, what did that mean? We had people who built careers with us. So our beauty experts, we have one beauty expert who started with us 12 years ago as a, as a sales associate in our Philadelphia store. Today she runs half the country uh, and um, has, a, has a nice salary and a great life and has really grown and developed with us. So for us, developing our teams is really, really important and we're all in it together and our team knows that. Um, so in terms of the metrics, yes, there's a lot of the anecdotal um, information that comes from the field and our relationship with our beauty experts. Um, I don't know all of them by name, but I definitely used to. Um, so, um, but great question. Excellent. Next, uh, we have one at the front here. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm Shelley Porges. Thanks so much for your insights. Thanks, Robert. Hi. Um, you, to build on what you were talking about in terms of the dearth of capital going into women-funded businesses, um, one challenge that I see is exactly what was just going on in this conversation, which is we talk about lack of access to capital, and we immediately jump to venture. And I, I think then most conversations, with some notable exceptions, we omit the full spectrum of funding that is available and should be tapped into by women entrepreneurs. So I wonder if you could comment then, and I'm talking about everything from the women's own capital, her friends and family, crowdfunding, which apparently is going disproportionately to women now, which is a good thing, uh, and, and so forth. And what the role of that is in terms of particularly generating an opportunity for growth capital even before you get to the $25, $50 million venture round. Yeah, I, I think it's really important. I think why we go to venture is because it's the most measured, right? It's the most studied um, because you have a population that's easy to find and access, which is you go to the venture capital firms, you go to Crunchbase, you go through the data. So to really be successful long term, we have to build the data set. So we have to build the friends and family data set. We have to build the data set of angel capital because until you have something you can study, it's hard to talk about. And so I think that's critical. It's actually a good idea. Maybe we should go to all the crowdfunding sites and do even more research, you know, both quantitative and qualitative. But the data set helps bring attention to an issue and the stories. And so what, what you're pointing out is that we need more data, we need more st stories, and we need to understand the full pipeline from friends and family all the way through to scaling a venture. So you're 100% you're right, and I think it starts with data, and I'm really proud of all of these um, entrepreneurship institutes, including what University of Maryland is doing, because it brings attention to the opportunities. Next question. Oh, everyone's so shy. Do we have any questions on Facebook? Any Facebook questions? Excellent. I think we have some Facebook questions here. We'll take one from the audience first, and then we'll come to the Facebook questions next. Hi, my name's Katie. Hi. And um, as far as your partnership, what, do you, what would you say works? Mm -hmm. Why does it work? Yeah. Why does it work really well? So first of all, let me take a step back. Most ventures, even we saw on stage, have two people that start them. And it's because there's two different sets of tasks. And it tends to be strategy and vision, and then the other is just hardcore execution. And so, you know, the famous entrepreneurs that we see, you know, Steve Ga uh, Steve, Ga <laughs> Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. You see Bill Gates um, and... Um, 
Paul Allen, thank you. Um, so you see these two, these partnerships, um, and so with Barry and I, you know, I was always strategy and the dreamer, and he was hardcore and is today execution. And so I think when you look at, you don't always hear about the two founders or the two people involved in starting something, but you tend to have these two subsets of skills. Um, and so I think if you talk to everyone on stage today, they would be able to divide, divide out who's good at what. And sometimes you see uh, founders that are on their own, and they end up hiring that second skill set, which is also a way to go. But you have to be aware of the skill sets that you have and what you need. And so I think for us it works because I could dream, and then uh, you know Barry would make it happen. And I I think you know that's Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak too. So excellent. All right, now we're going to go to Facebook. Tambia Fur asks, "How did you come up with the idea for Blue Mercury?" And when first starting Blue Mercury, did you envision one day selling, or did you think it would be a legacy business? Great question. So, um, so when we started Blue Mercury, you could only buy cosmetics at department stores and drug stores. And I was always a beauty junkie. I knew everything about beauty products, but it was a hobby. I was, you know, on this path, you know, Berkeley economics. I was going to go change the world in a different way. Um, but then after I met Jeff Bezos and then I met Barry, I'm like, we have to do something with the internet. And so we were scanning for ideas and we thought, let's bring beauty products to the internet. It didn't exist then. And it was such a pain to go drive out to the mall and buy your beauty products. And by the way, when you got there, everything was sold counter by counter and you would go to the counter and no one would help you because you didn't look like you had any money, which was my problem. Uh, so, and this was before, you know, you had, you know, that French company that has a cosmetic chain and you, you had, you know, all of these multi-branded cosmetic chains. This is just drug stores and department stores. And, you know, I thought there had to be a better way to shop for cosmetics where, you know, people were friendly, where you had access to them. And it, every venture starts with solving a problem. The problem we solved was it was a terrible experience shopping for cosmetics. And, you know, it's been an 18-year journey. Um, you know, I, I think people think entrepreneurship, you hear all these success stories that it's overnight. I mean, we built the business uh, from the ground up year after year. We almost went bankrupt twice. We went through two recessions. So I, I don't think Barry and I were ever building to sell. You build to create a great institution. And I'm proud we have a company that's, you know, over 1,000 employees and 93% women. And we're still running it. The balance sheet has changed, right? But, you know, our, our team's still intact. Um, and so you, I think you have to start to build something great. You can't start for any other reason. Great, and um, we'll go ahead, go right here. Got one up there? All right, excellent. We'll go up here, you're next. Hi, thank you, Marla. My name is Amy Ziff. I'm the founder of an organization called Made Safe, which means made with safe ingredients. So we look at all kinds of products from baby to beauty to bedding. Um, and so my question for you is really about performance. You were talking about numbers. Numbers tell every story. Um, what do you see about mission-driven products versus, let's say, the conventional? So whether or not it's the vegan line or something that was created with um, more maybe conscious uh, ingredients from another perspective. You know, how are you seeing those kinds of things, both in demand from what the consumers are asking for, as well as how they perform in terms of sales in your business? So, uh, um, you know, we've been studying and analyzing natural um, and organic and mission-driven products since we started. And when we started, there was a beautiful line called Aesop, which exists today, but. I love this brand. It was so natural, and you know everything they did was recycled. It was a great mission, and it didn't sell. We were a little bit too early 18 years ago, but we started to see this trend uh, for mission and great product that has great ingredients really accelerate or uh, start about 10 years ago, where the clients started asking. Now it's you know. You know, everyone wants to know all of the ingredients, you know, what the mission is, what the cause is, and I think it's such a great thing. It creates so much opportunity for great new brands to develop. And so I think what happens is um, 
sometimes people have missions and the world is not ready for them uh, and then they come back um, and so the consumer sometimes has to catch up to the great things coming and sometimes the consumer sees them first but I think today more than ever there is so much opportunity for mission and me meaningful products um, so great great point excellent and uh, we'll take a question right here Thank you so much. My question was actually very similar to hers, but I will change it and adjust it. My name is Rahma Wright. I'm a social entrepreneur that works with women in West Africa who produce shea butter products. And what my company do, does, we ethically source shea butter from these women in a way that's creating living wages. So it's very much focused on being a mission-driven business. And being a startup entre entrepreneur in the beauty world, it's been really challenging because with the way that distribution works and how certain systems are set up, it's very hard to break into mass market. It's very hard to break into sales and distribution. And I just wanted to know if you have any thoughts on um, resources or incubators that are specifically uh, focused on consumer goods mm -hmm. or focused on the beauty industry that I could tap into. No, it's a great point. Um, I think with any new entre entrepreneurial venture, finding customers is one of the hardest things you do, um, and finding partners, and that is the role of the leader of that organization. Um, I think L'Oreal has a new incubator that they just partnered with someone in New York City on. I can't remember the name of it. Um, but the greatest thing right now is the economy is so good that you're seeing incubators spring up everywhere and we all need to take advantage of that uh, to really uh, drive our businesses. So L'Oreal has one. Most of them in consumer tend to be in New York City because of the resources available or San Francisco. Um, but I would definitely look into that one. It is a hard in industry to break into. Um, you know, you just have to pitch and pitch and pitch, but that is true for any entrepreneurial venture. So. All right, and I'm going to take the last question here. Um, so we have a lot of entrepreneurs at the very beginning of their journey. Uh, you get to give one piece of advice on top of all of the other advice, but one more piece of advice. Uh, what, do you, what do you say to them um, as they stare into the abyss and prepare to eat glass? <laughs> I didn't say glass. I said double shot. <laughs> so, it's true. Um, so um, I will say that life happens while you're building your organization. So even though it's a marathon that begins with a sprint, you know, once you get through that first year sprint, make sure you're living your life also. So, you know, I, I thought I would sort of build Blue Mercury and then move on and do something else at some point. But Barry and I built our whole life while we were building our company. So our kids actually have store numbers associated with them. <laughs> so our our 13 year old now Ariel is store number five <laughs> uh, uh, you know our 11 year old Sophie store number eight <laughs> and our son Luke store 12 through 20 so <laughs> remember um, to take care of yourself you're building your life while you're building your company uh, and don't lose sight of that because people say oh it's never a good time to do to get married or to know have a family or to I can't you know spend time with my mom because I'm building my venture so I'm still building blue mercury um, both of my parents have passed build your lives while you're building blue mercury Wonderful. or while you're building it. Marla thank you thank you very much Incredible. All right. So uh, we have a, a lot of time now uh, to get a chance to speak with Marla, to speak with the entrepreneurs. Uh, I Just looking out here, there's so many incredible people in this audience. Get to meet someone you haven't met before. Uh, this is an incredible group. And to echo what Kate had said earlier, find a social entrepreneur who's early on their journey. Figure out how you can help them. Thank you for coming today, and we hope to see you back soon.